my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, DeRay Kirkland, Vice President of Diversity Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer with Cardinal Health. So here's a little something about DeVray. This is actually from his official bio. Um, but I also want to mention that um, I have uh, the privilege of serving with DeVray on um, a local board for Mount Carmel College of Nursing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting him to know him better as well in our service there. So DeVray Kirkland is Vice President, Diversity and Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer for Cardinal Health. A $121 billion company with over 49,000 employees in 60 countries. His key responsibilities include the development and implementation of a comprehensive enterprise-wide diversity strategy through related programs, initiatives, and projects. He also provides direction to business segments on tactical programs and systems related to attracting, retaining, and promoting a diverse workforce while establishing an inclusive work environment in support of Cardinal Health's corporate values, policies, and practices. His involvement was key in the development of the internal Diversity and Inclusion Council and employee resource groups. Mr. Kirkland volunteers his time by serving as a board member of the American Heart Association of Central Ohio and sits on the Board of Trustees for the Mount Carmel College of Nursing. He earned a bachelor's degree in zoology management from Howard University in Washington, D.C., and a master's degree in human resource development from Bowie State in Bowie, Maryland. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kirkland. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you all. I thank President John. Um, uh, certainly my friend Bill Lane, who's not here, for having that opportunity to connect me with this group. And hopefully this afternoon be able to share with you just some insights and thoughts around diversity inclusion, not only from a Cardinal Health perspective, but just the space in general, and then have some time for uh, some questions. So happy to be here. A couple of the areas that I want to touch on uh, today, certainly why so many companies are talking about diversity inclusion, that's something that's been a very hot topic that we've heard a lot about lately, so I want to touch a little bit on why that's happening. Uh, certainly, how does it apply to your current business strategies? Uh, because one of the things that we really try to focus on is that this is a business initiative. It's not an HR initiative, and that's really something that's really important for us as folks that are leading businesses. Certainly, what can you, your business company, organization, uh, do to develop some awareness around what's happening in diversity and inclusion because I think sometimes there are things that are happening and we're just kind of on autopilot a little bit uh, so we kind of don't see those things happening or we don't realize those things are happening so awareness will be key and then finally how do you take action either solve business challenges or create new opportunities so a lot of this work sometimes solves things but it also opens up opportunities for folks to continue to uh, drive the work forward. So as I move forward, one of the things that I certainly wanted to share with you is a little bit just kind of the purpose around Cardinal. I think probably many of you have heard of Cardinal, if not, have seen Cardinal Office 270, know a little bit about our business, about the size of the organization. But I think for us, really, what's really imperative to think about and why diversity and inclusion is really important for us is healthcare touches everyone. It's not something that just touches one group, it touches everyone. So it's not just African Americans that are diabetics or Caucasian people that need heart catheterizations or Hispanic and Asian people that need knee and hips. Everybody needs everything. And I think to uh, uh, the, the, the lady that presented earlier about the kids camp, uh, cancer doesn't discriminate. And I think that's something that we all realize and understand. And so this work that we're doing touches everyone. And it's really important for us, especially at Cardinal Health, to realize that because we want to be able to create products and solutions that touch everybody and work for everybody. So that's our mindset going into it. A little bit of data on us that kind of helps tee up this conversation so you can understand where we're coming from. Obviously, the size and scale. We're at about 48,205 folks um, right now. Um, we're in about 40 different countries um, right now. Some of the top five countries in order are listed here in which we have folks that are working for us. Uh, we have 95% of our folks sit in about 10 countries, although we're in 40. So I think if you have one or two people in the country, somehow they give you credit for the whole country. I don't know how that math works, but that's just what they tell us. 
Uh, and then certainly one real key point that I'm very proud of is that we're at 49.8 percent female um, representation in our entire company and that's top to bottom and that's a global number. And the reason that I'm excited about that is particular is because women are half the population so it would be nice to be close to at least 50 percent to show that you have that representation. Now the challenge becomes do you look like that in leadership and the answer for us is no. We do not. And one of the things that I think is really important is to realize what are you good at and what are you needing opportunities to work at. And that's something for us that's very important that we continue to talk about. The generational breakdown I wanted to share in particular because we still have traditionalists that are working for us at 70 plus uh, in some of our pharmacies. And then we have Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z, and of course the baby boomers as well. But if you can think about how these different generations work and how they engage with one another, the traditionalist population, very much so a handshake and my word is my bond and I'm going to take care of things. And then certainly when you get down to the Gen Z population, if you're not texting and sending the right emoji or the right emoticon, you might send someone into a tizzy fit because you just said something that makes them upset and you didn't know that. Uh, I, I, I'm a teenager, have a teenager at the house, and I'm learning new things each and every day that I don't know. So if you have a teenager, you know a teenager, you've been scarred by a teenager, then, then, then you understand exactly where I'm coming from and what I'm talking about. Because sometimes it's very challenging to get them to understand the differences and how things operate. But all of these different generations are in the workforce at our organization currently. And the Gen Z population we're expecting to potentially double in the next three to five years. So when you think about that demographic changing, that generational aspect changing, a fully digital group um, with an organization or a gender or a generation that is not the same, how do we work well together? How do we transition information and certainly how do we share information, which is big for us. So let me start, why are so many companies talking about diversity and inclusion? I think there's a lot of reasons, but I'll bring up a few just to kind of get the juices flowing. Um, I don't think there's anybody on the planet that hasn't heard of the Me Too movement. And I think something as serious and significant as that particular movement has lots of people thinking about why is this, how does this impact my workforce? How does this impact what we're doing? There are certain organizations that have had challenges. I'm sure you're all familiar with what Starbucks had to go through. And they end up shutting down all of their stores to do some training for all of the stores across their footprint, which is very significant. And then finally, time's up. So there's a lot of different movements and, and things that are happening throughout the United States and globally that have people starting to think about why is this important and how does this impact an organization? So one of the things that I'll touch on quickly is Me Too. And as devastating as it is to so many women that have had to go through that particular situation and had to deal with those types of things, one of the things that we've kind of noticed, not just in Cardinal Health, but as an overall, is how does that impact the landscape of communication between men and women in a corporate environment? I have actually had men that have come up and said to me, I'm not having any more dinners or lunches with any females. And I said, well, how's that going to work? Because we know that through some of these dinners and some of these conversations is where you get to know people, you get to learn people, you get to have a different level of trust. And when that comes up for an opportunity for them to be promoted or an opportunity for them to get that next assignment, do they miss out on that? Because they weren't given the same opportunity as maybe their male counterparts. And that's something we have to think about. Because if you can't have a lunch or you can't have a dinner the same as you would with any other person on your team, the question is why not? And unfortunately, this situation draws a lot of attention to behavior that is unexcusable, but it does not change the fact that that is a part of how business gets done. And that is a part of how we should be engaging with our peers and colleagues. If you can do that with a man, you should be able to do it with a woman, and you should feel comfortable doing both. And so those are things that we have to think about because they're impacting how we do business. They're impacting how we get to know people. Another thing that's also really important to think about is we start thinking about kind of how people are promoted or how people get the opportunity to grow or how people get certain opportunities in the workforce. One thing that kinds of come to mind is how we talk about individuals and how we have conversations. So an example, if you're having a conversation about talent and you're talking about should this person get this opportunity or this person is stellar, this woman is amazing, 
she's doing a great job at doing this. She's, I mean, she's killing it. She's knocking it out the park. You know, and she's a single mom. Pause. Why are we mentioning that she's a single mom? That has nothing to do with her performance. But yet and still, a good intention to pile on to say that we think she's doing above and beyond and she's doing something incredible, we wouldn't say he's a single dad. That's probably not part of our conversation. So we want to make sure that as we start talking about things that we're fair and equitable about how we discuss people. Or maybe we shouldn't give that opportunity to her because she has small children. She's not asking us to babysit. She's taking care of that. So are those conversations that we should allow to come into the workforce to have conversations about performance, or should it be strictly about the performance? This is why organizations are having more and more dialogue around how we talk about enterprise talent, male, female, or underwise, otherwise, and how we are going about having those conversations. So those are critical points that I certainly wanted to bring up just as examples. We certainly want to have a culture transformation. And one of the things as far as the topic was around, how do you create a competitive advantage through diversity and inclusion? Lots of organizations out there can copy the way that you deliver solutions or your supply chain or the products that you create. The one thing that they can't copy is your people. So when you start thinking about what is the differentiator, it is the people that you have in your organization, but it's also the people that you recruit to your organization and the people that you retain in your organization. There is significantly a war on talent out there, and we know that. Best and brightest are being picked every day from other organizations and other companies. So are you as a business leader, are we as a company re-recruiting our folks each and every day? Because if we're not, someone else is on the phone on the other end. And if you're thinking people aren't calling your folks, don't be fooled. They're calling your folks too. So we need to make sure that we're clear in how we're re-recruiting our talent each and every day, letting them know that they're a value add, and letting them know that they make a difference in our business because that's the one thing that other organizations cannot copy. So when I think about why companies are talking about those types of things, it makes sense if you're trying to grow your business. If you're trying to grow your organization, you have to be thinking about the best talent. You have to be thinking about how you recruit and how you promote and how you retain. Those are things that should be everyday conversations. The other part about diversity inclusion on this particular topic, as I said before, it's not a, a HR thing. It's not an HR program. This is a business imperative. There's lots of data that has been shown out there that diverse groups as a whole have better productivity and increase the products in which they are able to, pr to produce. That's, that's given, that's a data. But it's not just about race, ethnic, ethnicity, and gender. It's also about diversity of thought. You could have lots of different people in the same room. And if they're not thinking all the same way and they're different vir virtues and ideas of thought, that's incredible, that's what you want. And it's not just based on what they look like or what gender they are, it's the diversity of thought. And I would tell you, I know it may be a news flash to some, but there are some really, really incredibly smart people that did not go to the Ohio State University. <laughs> I know it's a news flash. I, I, I mean, I'm, I didn't mean to upset anyone. I, you know, don't take my lunch away. I, I just, but I need people to know that. Um, because if we recruit everyone that comes from the Ohio State, as tremendous of a school it is, and we learn from the same philosophers, the same professors, the same way of approaching a topic, if I present something to you and we've learned it from the same professor, it checks all the same boxes because you learned it the same exact way I did. We followed the same seven steps and I, I checked them all off. So we all feel good about it. Now the challenge is if you went and had somebody from the school up north, let's say, and they happen to share some information with you. Once you got past the fact that you didn't like them to start with and you actually wanted to listen to them, there may be some value in the way that they approach a subject that might eliminate some of the blind spots, that might look at something differently. So those are things that you certainly want to make sure are incorporated into this whole diversity conversation. It's not just race, ethnicity, and gender. It is diversity of thought. And that is something that if we're all in a room, if there's a room full of white males, you can still have diversity of thought. And that's something that we need to make sure is really, really put out there as a forefront as another characteristic. The other thing, as I move forward into the next slide, 
How does this apply to your current business strategies? Um, certainly, there's a war on talent, I said that. But the competitive advantage is part of the culture piece. When you have an organization or you have a place where you can bring 100% of yourself to work each and every day, it maximizes the opportunity of you being who you are and bringing your best productivity. That's something that we stress at Cardinal Health. Now my challenge is if I've got 48,000 folks, 48,205 to be exact, and I have exactly four people on my team, and we're in 40 different countries, I do not have a G5 jet on standby. Our passports are not flying all over the globe. And right now, actually, you've got 50% of my team in this room with you. So there's not a whole lot of work that's going to be going on if it's just depending on us to get it done, right? So one of the things that we spend time talking about, which is critical, is that this has to happen from each person. Each person has to be part of this process. We need people to lead from wherever you sit in the organization. It doesn't have anything to do with the title. It doesn't, ha doesn't have anything to do with the amount of people that report to you. It doesn't have anything to do with what location, if you're here in Dublin or if you're remote. We just need you to lead from wherever you sit. And I tell everyone, the biggest focus area that I want you to be focused on is yourself. I don't need you to be focused on anyone else. I don't need you to catch them on Facebook Live and then put them out there and you know, you are the DNI police and so you've caught people doing things wrong. That's not what I need. I just need you to focus on you. I need you to focus on how you handle things, how you look at things. What are the day-to-day -day behaviors every day that you have that are impacting others in a positive way or a negative way? And if you're able to do that, we'll create some inroads and we'll be able to do some things that move the needle forward. The second piece of this current business strategies piece is, what is the needle? How many times have you heard someone say, we need to move the needle, and you go, yes, we do. And then they say, what needle? And you go, that's a good question. We probably need to figure that out. Because if we don't all agree on what the needle is, we're all going to be moving towards something different. So we, can't all be, we can all be rowing, but it'd be nice if it's in the same direction so that we can actually gain some ground. Because what we see is everyone has a lot of activity. But if you're a business owner, you know activity does not equate to results. You have to have something that is driving towards you getting results. So being clear on what that means to you, what it means to the organization, what it means to your business function if you're a business leader. And then how can you make small steps? Because what we have to do is figure out how we can get off autopilot. Because sometimes we all can get on autopilot. And I'll ask this question, and if you're honest with yourself, answer it yourself, certainly. But how many times in the last 30 days have you gotten in the car, you're driving home from the office, you know, you're getting ready to go home, and then the next thing you know, you're home. You don't remember the drive. How many people have had that happen? You weren't texting, you weren't on the phone, you just, it's artificial intelligence, just took you home, you know, and, and, and you should think about how many people work in the same location because you're probably leaving at the same time, and then you're on the highway doing 65, probably more than that, but you don't remember the drive home. You don't remember how you got there. You were supposed to stop at the store, you didn't stop at the store. You forgot to pick the kids up. They're still at daycare right now. Still, <laughs> they're waiting on you. But we're, we're, we're in autopilot. So we have to recondition ourselves to take ourselves off autopilot and be present. But that also means we have to unlearn some things that we've learned. And that's something that is also a challenge because we are all creatures of habit to a certain degree. There are certain things we like a certain way. If you have a staff meeting, most people sit in the same seat if it's in the same room. It's just a comfort level. And if there's a new person that comes into the meeting and they sit in the wrong seat, you're going to be like, that's, that's President John's seat. You can't sit there. And they're like, but it's open. No, no, you don't understand. That's where President John sits. That's his seat. He's with us in spirit. You don't see him, but that's his seat. We save it for him. You have to wait till everybody gets seated. Then you can sit down since you're the new person. Or when we get on an elevator all the time. Everybody fights for four corners. There's only four, but everybody's fighting to get into an elevator corner. We do it, back right up into it. Or we don't talk on elevators. It's not a library. It's just an elevator. And if you notice it, when you get on, you could be having a full-blown conversation with someone, but yet and still you stop the conversation when you get on the elevator. Wait till the door closes. Patiently wait. Then all of a sudden, boom, as soon as the door opens, you start talking again. It's interesting. 
I've tried some things, and, and Adrian can attest to it. I do it at our office just to test my own thoughts. But I get on an elevator, and I face my back against the door, and I look at everybody. <laughs> totally throws them off. And then I start talking. They think words way, and they're like, how do we change things up? So we're thinking differently, so we're living in the present, so that we're aware of what's going on around us because awareness is certainly gonna be key. For our organization, we've had lots of acquisitions. And probably in the last five to seven years, there's probably been 25 large and small acquisitions at Cardinal. How do we blend those organizations together? You know it's very difficult when you have brand loyalty to your particular organization and you get acquired or there's a merger, where do you fit in? How do those cultures meet? How does the, what the values of the organization, how do they align? What's the culture gonna be now? Those are all things that you have to think about as you're trying to merge together. That's why the idea of inclusion is critically important. Because for us, the idea of diversity is all of the differences. It's the mix that you have in the organization, which is amazing. But inclusion is the key, because inclusion is how the mix works well together. You could have a tremendous mix of individuals in your organization and still not be able to hit your organizational goals because you can't work well together. You can't get things done. That's why all-star teams lose. You have some of the best and brightest talent, but they can't figure out how to work well together. That's what, is, as an organization, one of the things that we continue to strive for because it's really important for us as an organization to grow in that way. What can you, your business company, do or organization to develop awareness? This one's really interesting because I think as we start having more and more conversation, one of the things we have to understand is quickly this, is that everybody doesn't see things the same exact way. We are all looking at things from different perspectives. If I did an exercise and I say, list all the words that come to mind for diversity and inclusion for you, we would probably have 100 different variations of what that means, none of which are wrong, just different because of our perspectives and the way that we have grown up. If I ask you right now, I say, when you were a child, and they said, never talk to whom, who would that be? Now we say, talk to everybody. We're going to have kumbaya and sing, have s'mores by the fire after work. And we're going to do it just like that, just tomorrow. We're reconditioning ourselves. We have to re-educate ourselves. That's not the way in which we were raised, not the way in which we grow up. But now we're expecting something different without giving people the opportunity to adjust. And that's one of the things that's critical for us is how do people adjust? Everybody doesn't adjust to the same things the same way. If you're like me, I don't mind change. You can change it up today, can change it up tomorrow. I'm just going to roll with the flow. But we all know there's people that don't like change. And if you change their routine or you change their methods, it's going to be very uncomfortable for them. And we know that. But we all work together. So how do we make that happen? Those that are very fluid in thinking along those lines as well as those that are more set. How do we make those things happen? Some of the things that we're doing is we're launching an unconscious bias training, and probably you've all heard about that. We're launching ours that was internally developed next week, and we're really excited about that. And we're pushing it out to all of our vice presidents and above as a start globally, and then allowing everyone, US, Puerto Rico, and Canada, to, to get on board with that, and then we're pushing it out to the rest of the organization globally. Because we think understanding unconscious bias, and everybody has it. It doesn't matter who you are. We all have unconscious bias. Even to which grocery store we go to, which gas station we prefer, you know, we have unconscious bias. But the question is, is it negatively impacting your opportunities to make decisions around performance, around business, around engagement or interaction? Those are things that certainly drive and impact the business. So we have to be aware of that. We're doing training, what we call Partners Leading Change, which is a cohort where our women partner with our men. Because it's important that men understand the challenges that women go through, and believe it or not, women, men go through challenges as well. It's really important, though, that men understand in the business world that in our organization, 80% of the management positions are men. So in order for the women or any other minority group to excel, the, the majority population has to be part of this process. Everybody has a story and everybody's input is critically important, but you just need to know where you fit in and how you can make the positive impact. <clears throat> and as I move to this particular slide, how do you take the actions you know, that will either solve business or change uh, or create 
new opportunity, excuse me. One of the things that I think is important about all of this is as you're trying to solve other things, it's just like anything else, you open up new doors. As you peel the onion back and you keep peeling, you keep finding other things, you keep finding things that are impacting. So it may solve one issue, it may help a business scenario or situation, but does it open up something else? And my challenge to any organization that's trying to do this work is if you are researching and you're surveying and you're asking people their thoughts and what they think and getting data back that shows that there's opportunities, the question becomes, what are you going to do about it? If you find that there's something going on or there's something wrong happening, what are you going to do? I think, you know, the, the CEO of Salesforce, Benioff, is amazing because one of the things he did, and you might have saw it on 60 Minutes or some other places, where he surveyed his organization around gender equity and pay. And he found that there was a discrepancy in his pay and what he was paying men and women. And his CHRO asked him, if we find something, are you willing to do something about it? And he said, of course, because at that particular point, he didn't think they would find anything. Well, they did, to the tune of $3 million. So he kicked in $3 million, said, we're going to make this up. We're going to get this right. We're going to make it happen. They ran it again. About a year later, another $3 million. Why? Because he acquired companies, and when he acquired those companies, those inequities came with those companies as well. So he was trying to straighten it out in his organization. So are you willing to make the commitment to make change once you find that there's an issue? If not, why ask? Because a lot of times we ask a lot of questions and want the feedback, but then we're not willing to do what's necessary to make the changes or to make things better. So I would say that's really big. It's not the intent of what you're trying to do, it's the outcome. It's not always what you think, it's how it's received. Because for me, if I had the person at the very back of the room and I said, you know what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand this glass vase to one of my wife's favorites. It's water for crystal. And I said, I'm gonna hand it around the room to the very back of the room. We would all be very, very careful with it. And I would appreciate that because I'd like to stay married. <laughs> But if I said, everyone's going to put baby oil on their hands and we're going to try it all over again, we would still be very careful, right? We would, we would be very gentle. But in the back of the room, gentlemen in the back of the room, very last, looking directly at me, what's your name, sir? Tom. So Tom, I'm going to throw the vase to you because you look skilled. And if I say, I'm going to throw the vase to the very back of the room to Tom, what might happen besides everyone in these four tables ducking? It might fall, right? It might break. It might shatter. It could shatter if we were handing it around and we actually dropped it by accident, right? Could happen. But at the end of the day, whether I threw it to Tom or we handed it around the room, if it fell and shattered, you know what? The vase feels the same. It's still shattered. It doesn't matter if our intent to be careful was for, to make sure that we had it. It doesn't matter the vase still feels shattered. So it's not about our intent, it's what the outcome and it's what is the feeling. And I think that's something that's really important. We have to listen to employees, we certainly have to hold people accountable, and we then certainly have to make sure that we are on top of things. My final slide is you gotta have commitment from the top. My CEO, Mike Kaufman, my CHRO, Ola Snow, tremendous leaders in the aspect that they understand what diversity and inclusion is about. Mike has led our women's initiative group, which is one of our seven employee resource groups for 10 plus years as the executive sponsor. Ola has led our proud group, which is our LGBTQ plus group for over five or six years. And now in their roles now, we've assigned them to different leaders to be a part of this. But Mike has them all leaders that support as executive sponsors are in the top 20 in our organization as a company. And I think what that says is that it's important that we have key leadership in those roles, but it's important that you have comp the, the communication and you have the support from key leaders. It's not just in what you say and how you nod your heads, it's the actions that follow those up. Because if your actions don't meet your words and don't follow up on your words, then we're gonna have some challenges and it's gonna be very difficult for us as a whole to figure out how we move forward. Because we've all sat in a room where everyone nods their heads on, in, in agreement that this is something we're gonna do, but then we walk out of the room and it's something different. It's not the same. 
So we need to make sure that we have leadership at the top, leadership throughout that continues to help us drive this work. And I think one of the things that we found out is that that is such a critical component because it can't just be something that we put out. It can't be just an award that we're trying to win because at the end of the day, if I want to go work a place, I'm not gonna look online to see what their recommendation is or what place they got or what ward they won. That's not gonna be important. I'm gonna call my friend Tom that's in the back there and say, Tom, what's it like working there? And if he says it's not great, I'm not going. So it doesn't matter what award that you win or what magazine you're in. It matters how it feels to your employees. And that's what we're striving for, is making sure internally that we're doing the things that we need to do to make it a great place to work at Cardinal Health and that people can bring 100% of themselves to work. So with that, I'd love to have an opportunity to take a couple questions. Um, if there are, I'm happy to take those about anything I've covered or anything else that might be on your mind. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. We'll work our way back. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two different questions. Sure. So one is, how much do you care about your ESG rating? Um, the other question is, in your bias training, do you address, do you attempt to address that men don't always appreciate women who act like male leaders? So the ESG rating, yes, absolutely. I think if you're not paying attention to that, then you're missing the boat. I mean, that's, I think everyone should be thinking about that. So yes, to answer that, it matters a great deal. From the unconscious bias training, though, it's not so much that, and I think the question was, and help me, um, it, if you could rephrase, I want to make sure I capture it correctly. Men don't always, when women demonstrate male leadership skills, men don't always appreciate it. Okay. So, the question that I would have is, I'm not sure that I've always seen a clear definition of what men's leadership skills are compared to women's. I think they're leadership skills. So if we start talking about what skills belong to men and what skills belonging to women, then we already have a bias. So what we have to figure out how to do is address it in a way that we have leadership skills. It doesn't matter who's doing it or not. Because at times, we'll see men do things and we'll say, that's aggressive, he's a go-getter. And then if a woman does that, she has sharp elbows, she rubs people the wrong way. Their leadership skills, and part of unconscious bias is understanding that those skills are not gender specific. So in our course that we have going on, it's really understanding that people have differences, we all have biases, but how do we make ourselves aware of what those are so they're not impacting our opportunity to promote or opportunity to listen or opportunity to hear people out because we believe everybody in our organization adds value and the only way you can do that is not have a bias towards one or the other but I appreciate the question yes sir you talked about best talent and I think it's important in hiring and promotion and job assignments yes, but how do you go about defining best talent so I think the question is, how do you go about defining best talent in an organization? I think you have to do it a couple of different ways. The first thing that you have to look at is what does your organization need? Don't put a gender on it, don't put an age on it, don't put anything on it, it's just what does your organization need? And then when you do that, you need to cast a broad enough net to try to give you an opportunity to pull in talent from all over. Because one of the things that I think we find even in our organization is we're trying to fill a role so quickly because there's work that needs to be done and we don't have a whole bunch of time to wait. We need to fill this job because there's work to get done. Some points you have to just hit pause and say, we're going to look for the best and the brightest talent that is even representative of the people in which we, we, we work for and that we support. How do you then go in and evaluate that? Which also means that we have to take away from how do you diversify not only the slate of individuals, but the interview panel? Because if you, don't, if you don't do the interview panel and you just have the slate as diverse, then you still got everybody looking at the candidate the same exact way. We just had a diversity inclusion, uh, our first in the company's history town hall. It was a 90 minute town hall led by our CEO and all we talked about was diversity inclusion last week on Wednesday. And one of the things that he said is we had our controller, our treasurer up there, and we also had one of our vice presidents, GMs, and one of our business units. And he said, neither one of them had experience in the job they now sit in, but they're doing stellar. And that's because we want talented leaders that can learn and grow. 
And if anyone can learn and grow, what we try to narrow our focus down to and say, these are the 10, 20 things that are on our wish list of things that people have to have, the question is, do they need to have all 20? Because what one of the studies shows is that simply, men, if we have four of the 10 things that are needed, we're raising our hands saying we're ready for the promotion tomorrow. Women be like, I got nine. I need to get that last one before I apply. <laughs> Women, you don't need all nine. Raise your hand and let people know that you're interested and that you want to get involved. And that's what we have to shift our mindset is that what do you need? What minds do you need? What thoughts do you need that you don't possess? And then try to fill it using that lens as well. Thank you, sir. Any additional questions? Yes, sir. How successful have you been at transferring some of those issues to other countries who don't have anything near the culture that the United States has? Well, it's interesting that you say that because the person that's going to be working on our international strategy is sitting at this front table. And so I'm glad that you talked about his goal that he's working towards right now. I appreciate that uh, tremendously. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, we have looked at it, and, and we know diversity and inclusion is different throughout the United States and throughout the globe. For, I mean, if we talk about ethnicity, we would not go to China and talk about ethnicity. They said we have 56 of those. That's not a problem. Right? If we talk about LGBTQ+, we could say it's safe here for you to do those things and it's safe for you here, but in Brazil, that's not the case. Every 14 hours, a transgender person is killed. Every 19 hours, a person that's living their lives out as LGBTQ is killed in Brazil. So what we have to figure out is what locally makes sense for us to create a culture where a person can feel comfortable being who they are, but they're also, it's safe for them. And I don't think we have the answer for every country that we're in right now. We're starting to work on what does that international strategy look like. But it's very important that we list to locally what's happening and really get feedback. It's not going to be able for us to just throw out something that happens here in Dublin. Oh, here's the international strategy. We have to be listening to what's happening locally on the ground to understand the challenges that our associates would be facing and then figure out how we put strategies in place that will help them because that's the only way we can do that. And right now, we're starting that process. I've said that's one of the Adrian's goals that we're working on this year is what does that framework look like? Because we're in these countries, but do we have a framework? Do we have something that's going to work? And I would say the answer right now, no, we don't. But that's the reason why it's one of our goals. Yes, sir. Cardinal's Health has had some negative publicity lately regarding the prescription drug issue. Yes. I'm wondering how the leadership has handled that internal discussion and whether they're addressing any morale issues. Great question. And so, yes, I think the biggest thing for us to think about and as we think about as an organization is simply this. We want to do the best that we can for anyone and everyone that we service. And we realize that the opioid epidemic is a serious thing and we're behind it in any way and every way we can. We have been for over 10 years at providing education and support. We have to go through the process just like ABC, just like McKesson, just like any other supplier that's in this conversation at this point in time, and we're doing that. But what we try to stress internally is that we have good people that work at Cardinal. And there are a lot of people who are extremely hurt by what's going on and what they're saying about the organization. But we have to show it by example and by the individuals that we are and continuing to work hard. Our organization talks about it constantly because we know it's at the forefront. And we're trying to prepare our associates for things that they may or may not hear. But we keep focusing on we have to do our best for everyone that we work for each and every day. And that includes any situation that we're in. So from the standpoint of a mor morale, I think we're in a good place as an organization. I think we're working out of it just like anyone else would with any challenging thing that is happening on a national landscape. But we feel good about being Cardinal Health. And we feel good about working for Cardinal Health. Yes, sir. It's, uh you know, it's easy to say about, you know, just focusing on performance when it comes to women who are having children or are single moms or whatever, and that's really easy to say. But unless I wonder how your organization keeps women who are having children or who are single moms from falling behind in their career because their commitments may be greater. Sure. And you have, that's reality. Sure. You have to recognize that. Sure. So how do you recognize that? So how do you recognize that um, life changes are happening to women that may impact their ability to be in the office, and how do you make sure that they don't fall behind? Exactly. I think the thing that we try to do the most is understand we have enterprise talent. And whether the, the vacation that they take is a week or the vacation they take is 12 weeks, we look at it just as that. 
And when they come back, we try to make sure that we don't, they're not out of sight, out of mind. We have talent conversations where folks that are enterprise talent, we try to make sure that we have those conversations about what's next for those individuals. We try to also make sure there's one-on-one -on -one conversations with leadership so that they know this is where my person wants to go. It doesn't mean that they don't want to go there just because they decided to have a baby. They still want to go there. It's no different than the conversations that we would have with our men in the sense that they might not be ready right now. Now might not be the right time. We might need to wait a little bit. This is not the right situation. This is not the right job. Those are all conversations that we have. But it's really, really important to know that just because a woman has a child, takes some time off, could be just taking care of sick parents, doesn't make her a bad employee, doesn't make her not interested in her career. And if we treat her as such, that's the easiest way to lose some quality talent in an organization is to devalue it. And I think that's what people would be doing if they did that. So our focus is to make sure we engage people, we keep them on the radar, and we make sure we continue to have open dialogue with them about what is their next step in their career journey and figure out how we can help them. I think that my time might be up, so I'll turn it over. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Deborah. With that, thank you all for coming. <laughs>